My name is Dennis Speed, and I want to welcome everyone to today's town hall meeting with Lyndon LaRouche for September 14th. What you've just heard is an excerpt from the piece Jesu Minor Freude, uh, and that performance was actually done in 2013 at a Schiller Institute conference. But the piece in its entirety was performed this past Sunday by the New York City Schiller Institute Chorus as part of a program for 9-11. Uh, this was the uh, concert uh, program, a 9-11 memorial concert. We've been doing this as a, <clears throat> uh, as a practice ever since 2016 at the request of uh, Lyndon LaRouche, the late Lyndon LaRouche, who died on February 12th. And the reason I wanted to open with it is because there's a certain set of developments going from last Sunday until today, uh, which we were involved with and we're going to be uh, discussing and highlighting in our presentation today. <clears throat> there was um, the concept and what is actually being said there. I should just actually read that, the section of what you've just heard. This is section five of Jesu Minor Freude. <clears throat> and what the words are that were being sung are, state, Defy the old dragon, defy the jaws of death, defy the fear of them. Rage, O world, and quake. Here I stand and sing securely and in peace. God's might watches o'er me. Earth and abyss must be silent, however much they may grumble. Uh, when... Lyndon LaRouche was asked a question by a veteran, Pat, Patrick Savidio, concerning 9-11 and the issue of the 9-11 hijackers um, and what should be done to commemorate that occasion. He stated that what was needed was a living memorial. And that living memorial um, is not merely a concert, and it's not merely a remembrance of those people, but it's the resolution to bring their dead memory alive 
in the search for justice, which has never come to them because the people who actually perpetrated that action have never been brought to justice. So that the concept was not merely artistic, the concept was dramatically and emphatically a political one, but a much higher level of politics than what people normally think exists. Something like what that uh, idea of resurrecting the dead memory of the, those who gave their lives that day uh, something akin to it was also done uh, in Texas a few nights ago by Keisha Rogers. And we're going to show you an exchange that she had with Bridenstine, the head of the NASA program. Exactly. Yes, that's President. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much for your, for your service, and thank you for being an excellent NASA administrator. Um, my name is Keisha. I wanted to let you know that I have been a very strong proponent of the space program. Uh, we're actually, I wrote a report uh, in, on behalf of the National LaRouche organization. And what we're doing right now is we're circulating a petition in support of uh, President Trump's Artemis program. And we're getting quite a bit of support on campuses across the nation and internationally. Wow, yeah, so. Um, and I'll give you a copy of that report before we leave here. But Let me know what I can do to help. Yes, I thank you. Uh, and and my, my question to you is on the subject of not just supporting the next four years of 2024, but looking into the next 50 years of space exploration. You talked about the moon, Mar Mars mission. We're going to send human beings to Mars. It can't be take your time and yeah. then, let's do this, right. you know, getting people there in three, nine months. Uh, and there's a discussion that's coming up right now on the question of fusion propulsion. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I want to, you to speak on that because yeah. the importance of this right now is, you know, how can we actually get human beings to Mars safely, efficiently, through 1G acceleration, through advancing, maybe instead of three months, going there in less than a few weeks here. And I think that's a very important subject. Even the Russians are talking about the importance of uh, fusion, and many countries are looking to the moon as the basis for that, particularly on the mining of helium-3. So I'd like your comments on that. My goodness, there's a lot of things. Keisha, thank you <laughs> thank for your you. advocacy. And thank you for wearing that shirt. Keep doing that. Um, so, um, yes, a couple of things. You mentioned 2024. And, and, you know, some people have said maybe that's a partisan date. Remember, what, remember what Kennedy said by the end of the decade. He gave it a date. Why? Because that's how you get results. Um, and it's important that in this particular case, when we look at why the, what we compress the timeline, originally it was 2028, based on traditional budgets. The president said that's not good enough, so he said accelerate it. We did. He helped us with additional budget in the budget request. We did an amendment. We got, we got that amendment over to the Hill. But here's the important thing. NASA has not a science problem or a technical problem. We can retire all of the technical risks you can imagine. We're an amazing agency with amazing engineers. We have a political problem. That's why we're not on the moon right now. <laughs> That's why we're not at Mars right now. And, and Representative, or I, I should say, uh, Professor Brinkley has been very, very clear about why Kennedy was successful. It was bipartisan. And he gave it a deadline and he moved fast. There was a race. So when a program goes 15 years, 20 years, and costs billions of dollars and people aren't seeing results, that's when they get canceled. When we, when we cannibalize the science mission directorate to fund human exploration, that's when it creates a partisan fight. When we cannibalize the International Space Station to fund deeper space exploration, we create a par parochial fight. And I'm saying that because the Texas delegation is sitting right here in front of us. Um, so these are all things that we have, we, have a, we have a political science problem at NASA historically. I have been very clear, my, my objective is to fix that, and I've been working on it since the day I got in this office. Um, that being said, uh, fission. Uh, fusion, you said fusion. We're not there on fusion. That's going to take a number of years. Uh, for people in the room that might not be aware, fusion, of course, is, is you know, taking two nuclei and pushing them together. And you, basically, it's how you get energy out of the sun. Um, and, of course, the release of energy is, is, is massive. Fission is actually 
nuclei, nuclei breaking apart. Um, fission, I think, is, is in the short term. How do we do nuclear propulsion? It's going to be necessary to go to Mars. Radiation in deep space is harsh on the human condition. If instead of a seven to nine month journey, we can make it a two to three month journey, it's really good for the medical condition of the astronauts. Um, the, I, will, I will also say that we can do it so safely that it can, we can do it in a way that it could never be weaponized. Um, and, and, and certainly we don't want that, um, and we would never allow that to happen as an agency. Um, but I, I, I will say um, other countries do it. Um, other countries are developing that technology right now, uh, and, and we should be a part of it. But cis lunar space, when you talk about having nuclear propulsion in space, being able to maneuver in cis lunar, basically the space between the Earth and the Moon, is going to be critical for the future. Um, from a national security perspective, for all kinds of reasons that I'm not going to talk about here, but at the end of the day, that's a technology that the DOD is interested in. There's no reason if the DOD is developing it that we shouldn't take advantage of it for exploration, um, and it's important. So anyway, thank you all so much. You may have noted that the image above Mr. Bridenstine when he was speaking was that of JFK. And so when we talk about this idea of evoking the ghosts of a dead past in favor of informing the future, uh, this is something that is actually present. It's almost embedded in the American character, the actual American character versus the American posture, which is a different thing. Uh, we were carrying out this week something we called the International Days of Action, and we were active that is, the Schiller Institute was active on six continents with people going to campuses and other public locations uh, to uh, advocate the ideas of the Belt and Road. And Keisha's intervention was part of that set of actions. But there was something else that was also going on at the same time, uh, which involved Helga Sepp LaRouche. Can we go to the first graphic? She appeared at a conference together with Jacques Cheminade uh, of the Euro-Asia Economic Forum. This is a group that was established in 2005. And uh, although she didn't know it, uh, she became, she was drafted to be the, t the keynote speaker at the uh, second day of that conference where they have the think tank discussions. These are smaller. Uh, the entire conference probably had 1,000 people. The think tank, tank discussions are designed for certain groups of people from universities, from the political uh, spectrum. There were over, I believe, 50 nations that were represented at this conference. Uh, and she was the person that was uh, designated to lead off the second day's think tank discussions. Uh, so when you talk about the days of action that we carried out this week, it's necessary to start from the Sunday concert held here as part of the Living Memorial and what concluded with, or at least in our knowledge, concluded with Helga Sepp-LaRouche's work in China, uh, of which she will speak more in the upcoming days. Now, the reason for starting that way this week is that we have been involved in a process, which we've referred to a few times, uh, to establish what we've called committees of correspondence. And, and there was a reason we picked that name. We picked that name because these were organizations or associations that were established in, uh, particularly in Massachusetts and in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, and then later on throughout the colonies as part of precursor forms of organization for the American Revolution. Uh, we are in need globally of nothing less than a revolution um, in economic and social relations, this is something that has been proposed by uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese uh, through what is known as the Belt and, uh, and Road Initiative. But this is a part of a discussion that involved us, involved our people, involved Helga Sepp LaRouche from 1993 uh, until 1996 when the first conference on the New Silk Road was held in Beijing with 37 nations participating and including, that included Helga Zeppler-Rouche uh, being present for that. Uh, and so from that time until 2013, 
when a public offer was actually made uh, by the president of China, uh, both to the United States and all other nations, that they were participating in what was called win-win uh, politics. Uh, some people use different terms for it. There was an NYU uh, professor of Chinese extraction, Dr. Shung, who used to refer to this as from geopolitics to geoeconomics. Um, we wouldn't use that term in that way, but what we would say is that uh, there is a necessity to have a certain set of agreements, particularly between, among the United States, Russia, China, and India, and that that, con that concert of powers joined by others that joined that alliance were capable of removing the dominance of empire from the world. Can we go to the next graphic? Lyndon LaRouche, who passed away on February 12th, Abraham Lincoln's birthday, uh, campaigned for the presidency of the United States over the arc of eight presidential races. Next. The person that he was closest to from the standpoint of a presidential candidate uh, and president was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he, he, that is, Rose, uh, he spoke about, Lynn talked a lot about Roosevelt and others, but the reason that I think that Lincoln is the closest, we might argue about whether that would be John Quincy Adams or Abraham Lincoln, but the reason I think he was the closest is because of the character of what Lynn asked of the American people. And I want to refer to Lincoln's first inaugural, the conclusion of it, in 1861. I don't know if, whether people are familiar with the fact that when Abraham Lincoln was, was elected as president, the response was that seven states seceded from the Union. So uh, while we can talk about the problems or difficulties that the Trump administration may face in popularity in the United States, no one faced a situation like Abraham Lincoln. What did he say? What was his conception, therefore, when he gave his inaugural address in March of 1861? His conception was not much different than the one that's being put forward right now, both by Xi Jinping and by our own organization. And it was this that he addressed to the sections of the United States that had seceded. We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union. When once again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Now, there's a piece by Lyndon LaRouche that we referred some of our organizers to right after the uh, concert of Sunday. And it's called, To Save Civilization, Place Your Voice. And what it had to do with, this was a, a part of a discussion that Lynn gave actually in one of the meetings, one of our Saturday meetings. And when he began that discussion, uh, which, is, which is available, you can look online and get it. He talked a lot about the Manhattan Project, what we were doing in Manhattan. But then he said the, 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 that the intent behind what he had us doing was to create a single conception of the presidency, a single conception of union. And he said that the problem that we have in the United States and in other locations is that people don't know how to place their voices. He said that this is not a question of force or forcing out a sound from your throat. He said, actually, you have to create a kind of vacuum. And it's the vacuum that produces the tone, or your action upon the vacuum that produces the tone. Uh, why was that seen by him as being central to politics? Why did he believe, Lyndon LaRouche believe, that this conception of the proper tone and the proper placement of voice was so central. Well, Helga Sepp LaRouche many years ago, this would have been back in about 1986, caused great consternation and anger among her American colleagues when she 
insisted that the greatest poet produced by the United States was Abraham Lincoln. Um, and um, I concur with her, uh, with her uh, judgment. Uh, we argued about it. Many of us argued with her about it for many years. But if you understand that it was precisely the words of Lincoln, particularly at, at Gettysburg, that captured for the nation and for not merely the nation, but for humanity, what the importance was of that struggle. You know, now we are here, we are engaged in the great civil war, testing whether that nation or any other nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. The situation we're in right now and that we are seeing played out in the presidency of the United States right now is a fundamental battle for all of civilization. We sometimes forget the character of the people that we are fighting. And when you are looking at uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's behavior around uh, the uh, killing of Gaddafi in Libya, and when you look at the Obama each Tuesday kill sessions, and when you look at what was done uh, under the Bush administration, the Bush Jr. Uh, administration to Afghanistan and Iraq, neither of whom were involved in the events of 9-11, but done in the name of 9-11. So I realize that there is a need to create and to operate according to the better angels of our nature as a nation. But this may have to come from the citizens. It may not come from the, uh, shall we say, FDA-approved political process. Now, we've all would agree that there's a disaster on the Democratic Party side among all candidates. But I think we also have to equally agree that there is a disaster on the side of the Republican Party, which is a complete sort of uh, a barrel of monkeys might be the best way to talk about them. Uh, they don't speak on behalf of much which is human. And to purport that Donald Trump is actually running uh, uh, and representing the Republican Party is, I think, foolish, is folly. Now, I think this is an important conception to put forward because the issue as to parties is one that Mr. LaRouche discussed on his 90th birthday, and he talked about the end of political parties. But the other thing that Lyndon LaRouche became known for was defying the idea of empire. Now, although we had some other things, and I have a few other things to say, I'm going to leave much of that until later, uh, because we aren't going to escape discussing today something about the ideology of the British Empire. Now, that ideology is presently attempting to rear its head next week at the United Nations in the form of the discussion around uh, climate change or global warming or sustainable development. They all get used by these people as interchangeable terms. I know that sustainable development means something different, for example, to the Chinese than it means uh, to certainly Great Britain. Uh, I'm very aware that there are people at the United Nations that are trying to use that term and to discuss the idea of advancing and important concepts in economics. But, uh, but in fact, what we are looking at and what we are trying to intervene to do right now is that we have a short window before it becomes the case that British imperial interests again seize the political high ground. Right now, they don't have it. What's happened is that, as a result of many events over the period of June and July, uh, something else is going on. The uh, dismissal of John Bolton indicates that something is going on. It is foolish to draw conclusions on the few events that seem to pop up above the surface of an ocean uh, of volatility. And therefore, it's not right to say this is good and that is bad. What we can do is that we can deploy ourselves within that ocean of volatility to create other effects, new effects, and important effects. 
Um, something is going on right now which involves uh, the next speaker. Uh, he wrote together with Hussein Askari a piece called Sustainable Development Must Be Redefined as Sustained Development. The Belt and Road and the Apollo Program, Sources of Inspiration. I want to call attention to the second part of that title. The Belt and Road and the Apollo Program, Sources of Inspiration. Now, now what we have to do, and here is the problem of today's United States, the electoral process will yield nothing of importance in itself. But because of the electoral process, there's something we can do. We have a situation where the United States population has been trained and told it is to have an election. And it is to have an election and it's supposed to actually elect the person that leads the nation. So many Americans really believe that this is actually happening. Those of us who have understood politics in, in the United States, particularly since about 1976, know that what is called the electoral process is always a struggle for power among powerful factions. It very rarely involves the American people as a whole. This time, however, there's something different that is happening. Because the American people are being told, along with the rest of the world's population, that your very act of breathing pollutes the planet. And therefore, what's being proposed, including next week at the United Nations, is that many of us be eliminated. Now, it will be, it will be said in many different ways, but that is what will be proposed. The issue, the issue will be for us, are people dumb enough to say that's a good idea? And therefore, what we're out there trying to do is we're talking particularly to young people, and we're trying to take people because we figure they're not as stupid. They haven't gone along, they haven't been alive enough, long enough to go along with the idiocy and the stupidity that has otherwise been characteristic of much of politics globally. So what we want to do now is to talk about uh, this article, and I also should point out that it has been reprinted. This article has been reprinted in Nigeria, uh, a, in I think China, and in Pakistan. I think it's being serialized in Pakistan. And Jason is going to tell us a bit about its contents and why he and uh, Hussein believe that the Belt and Road and the Apollo program are the necessary sources of inspiration for the world. Good. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so let's uh, get these pictures up here. Hmm. All right, so we got to redefine sustainable development. Uh, have people, has anybody heard this? Is this a foreign term? If, if, has anyone heard the phrase sustainable used? You've heard it. What is a sustainable, what does that word mean? To continue unchanged. To continue unchanged? Okay, any other? Save. To keep it, okay. Yeah, we're gonna, so, but what, what's, what makes them sustainable, or, or why is that word introduced? Does anybody know? Yes. Oh, uh, well, sustainable is a derivative of attainable. So to attain something would be to stabilize what you were going after. Okay. Any others? Well, it, it's okay. supposed to not interrupt the, the functioning of the earth Okay. The biosphere. Not to nice interfere thing. with the earth. Well, what's the opposite <laughs> of sustainable? Unsustainable. Unsustainable. What would, we're going to get into it. Let's just think about what the, where this word came from and how often it gets used, even if it uh, doesn't really make any sense. So the, uh, it's true. The United Nations in 2015 set certain goals for 2030. They call them the sustainable development goals. And here they are. Um, some of them are, of course, very important. For example, eliminating poverty. That's a good goal. Zero hunger, that's a great goal. Good health and well-being. Who can argue with that? Education, clean water, energy, infrastructure, industry, 
reduced inequalities sounds very nice. So there's a lot of very important goals here. We should eliminate all poverty in the world. How are we doing on these? According to the United Nations, the world is not on track to end poverty by 2030, although some nations are. Um, as we see um, on this chart here, as we shall shortly again see, the world poverty has been going down. And this is a great thing. You can see in 1990, 36% of people on the planet poor, poverty. 2018, it's down to 8.6%. As I think people who have been to our meetings have heard, the majority of that reduction in poverty has been in China, where the poverty level has been reduced by seven or 800 million people. Fantastic news. Currently, the full elimination of poverty is not expected to occur in the world by 2030. It should, but we're not, we're not there at present. Okay. Let's take a look at the next one here. Oh, sorry. No, I keep going back and forth. Okay. Um, there number, let's, so, oops, number two is zero hunger. Um, number three, health. So there's some very good news here. The number of deaths of people under five years old is down almost in half over the last two decades, from 9.8 million per year in 2000 to 5.4 million in 2017. That's a good thing. Tuberculosis, down 21%. That's a good thing. Thanks to vaccinations, an 80% reduction in measles deaths. Since 2000, measles vaccines have saved over 15 million lives. That's a good thing. This is great news. HIV incidents in Africa, down. Great. Um, malaria is going up. I think there's a reason for that. Among the other goals that exist, there is a, an issue of literacy. There are 750 million adults in the world who are currently illiterate. There are 785 million people without clean water. Every year, two million people die of diarrhea. You can die of diarrhea, in case you didn't know that. 40% of people in the world don't have running water and soap, a place to wash their hands at home, a basic effort of sanitation. Almost 700 million people on the planet, as they put it, technically, practice open defecation. Does anyone know what that means? Uh, yes. It means you poop on the ground. Yes, no toilet. Three billion people lack access to clean cooking fuel. That means using burning dung or wood or something like that in your home um, to cook your food. That is serious air pollution right there. There's a, such a lack of infrastructure that in many African nations, productivity is less than half of what it could be due to a lack of infrastructure. And I think that's uh, too low uh, a value. Two billion people without trash collection. Nine out of 10 live in areas with polluted air. So there's a lot of things that, uh, where progress is needed. And let's talk about some of those successes. People have heard that China, for example, has serious air quality problems. People have heard that, I presume. So Beijing was one of the most polluted cities on planet Earth. And this year, it is proud of being below, it's out of the top 200 cities in the world with the dirtiest air. The, the, the fine soot, the particulate matter that is the, a cause of health effects, et cetera, reached a high in 2010 in China. It's now less than half that value. That's great progress. So things are moving forward. These are things people should be happy about. Now, when the UN meets this year, um, those aren't going to be the focus of the meeting. So here we go. Here's one of the sustainable development goals. On the bottom here, material footprint per capita in high income countries is 60% higher than in upper middle income countries and more than 13 times the level of low income countries. I wanna talk about what these numbers mean. So footprint per person, what does that mean, footprint? The cost. It's about, it, as you can see, the, can you see the unit there? 27 what, is it legible? Metric tons. Metric tons, it's big feet. Right? 
So this is the amount of material that's involved in the life of each person in a high-income country compared to two metric tons in a low-income country. Excuse me, when you say material, do you mean from a consumer uh, basis? Everything. Not just stuff that you like personally bought and brought into your home, but the subway train on a per capita basis. Your trash, the fuel, the coal or whatever that powered your home, the uranium that powered your home, all of these kinds of things. How much of an impact do you have in terms of the motion of material in the world around you? Now, when they give these numbers, they aren't pointing out that this should be increased in the poorer countries. The idea is that this is too high in the wealthier nations, that people are using too much, having too big of a footprint. One more trend here. So here is electricity use per person in the world. And as you can see, it's going up. This is great. This is great news. I don't know if you can see the values on the scale on the left. It's in thousands. And the world average is over 3,000 right now. Anybody know in the United States, average electric consumption per person in the US? About 13,000, so four times the world average. In uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, anybody want to take a guess? World average is 3,000. It's below 500 in Sub-Saharan Africa. You need electricity to develop. Let's look at one specific country and how its electricity use is a really great way of looking at how well people live. Here's Ukraine. <clears throat> the chart is starting with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you can see what happened to electricity consumption in Ukraine. If you can see the actual numbers, it fell almost in half over this first decade after the end of the Soviet Union. On this chart, we see life expectancy in Ukraine. There's the fall of the Soviet Union. So the same thing we saw with electricity use plummeting, we see the same thing, life expectancy dropping, people dying years earlier. So this year at the UN, with all of these things to think about, people pooping in the open, not being able to clean your hands, dirt burning cow dung to cook your food, illiteracy, clean water, that's not the focus. Instead. Uh, we're having a different focus, headed by a would-be murderer, Greta Thunberg, who's being used to promote an agenda of suicide. Here she is speaking with, in the center there, you see the Portuguese uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres. He's invited her to the United Nations to scold people into not being thoughtful about the future. Despite being at this meeting in the UN, she was mindful of her image, so she made sure to sit on the street outside the UN as well to make the claim that we're destroying the planet. This is part of a worldwide attempt to get young people to demand their own deaths. This is a rally in South Africa. Can you read the signs here? See what they say? There is no planet B, okay. Now, some of these do resonate a bit, don't they? Um, reduce CO2, don't destroy the ozone layer. Oops. Yeah, keep the oil in the soil. Okay. It's kind of like saying keep the baby in the womb. Now, the idea of sustainable development is that, as it was promoted by the United Nations when the term was coined in the 1980s, was that although people should grow and have their needs met, some types of growth simply cannot be continued forever into the future due to an overuse of resources. The original 1987 report from the UN said that modern societies, many of them, quote, live beyond the world's ecological means, for instance, in patterns of energy use. They said that sustainable development requires the promotion of values that encourage consumption standards that are within the bounds of the ecologically possible 
and to which all can reasonably aspire. We should encourage consumption standards that are within the bounds of the ecologically possible, they say. What determines what's ecologically possible? There you go. Yes. So, you know, they say that we're going to, there was a, a worry in the 80s that we're going to run out of various resources. Oil, certain kinds of metals were going to be too hard to get, et cetera, et cetera. These predictions did not come to pass. So what's happening is that essentially developing countries are being told that what the US did, what Western Europe has done, and so on, simply cannot be replicated today because it carries too great an ecological cost and you should just stay sustainably poor. Your poverty should be sustained. What we need to do is recognize that in order to have sustainable development, the su what makes development a sustained long-term process isn't using less to accommodate to current resources, but developing new ones. If you want to sustain development, the way LaRouche poses this in terms of the durable survival of a nation, it can only be secured through a commitment to developing new technologies, new scientific breakthroughs. So today, that would mean fusion, that would mean the moon development, it would mean going on to Mars with nuclear rockets, that's sustainable development or sustained development. It's development. So I just want to take a look at, uh, contrast that with what the British have been proposing. Now has anybody, I hope you aren't hungry right now, here's the BBC News, how eating insects could help climate change. Has anybody been pushed to eat insects recently? Oh, chocolate covered ones. They're delicious. Chocolate covered, they're delicious, okay, that's good, that's good. Oh, good. Thank you for doing your part. <laughs> now, if you don't like insects, maybe we could use lower quality meats. You know, they say meat is really bad for the environment, but maybe we're too picky about our meat. If we just, um, if we just ate dog food, maybe that would be better. You know, we can use all the parts of the ant. Now, th there's one trouble, though. If we eat the dog food, what are the dogs going to eat, right? Well, maybe we just shouldn't have dogs, and as a matter of fact, we could eat them, and that would be even better for combating climate change, according to the BBC, which says maybe we should eat our pets. Although, this may not go far enough, because without pets, many people might say, what's the point of life without my dog? Which is why we should maybe just eat people, too. <laughs> you know, let's go right to the problem. There's the British for you. So. I'm going to skip ahead a whole bunch of slides here because I left them in from before, um, from earlier. We had talked about why the global warming is not a catastrophe, the development needs of Africa. I just want to jump ahead to this, um, just to make a very simple point here. The four necessary laws that LaRouche has laid out to set the US and the world on a trajectory of growth include breaking from finance itself through the Glass-Steagall Act, creating a national banking system to make it possible to finance the kinds of infrastructure and development that we need. We need to have a physical metric of what economic growth is. We can't use financial measures because they don't capture the fact that when you have real growth, you're making more than, not more of. Money measures more of. Real economic growth is more than. And that's the center of LaRouche's economic approach. And then we need to have a commitment over many decades to come of the specific kinds of missions that are really going to be making us reach for generations. And for that, the, uh, the moon and then the Mars mission with the development of fusion power is key to this. The fact that we're going to be able to cooperate. Here's the US Orion crew capsule on its way to the moon in 2024. Here's the Chinese lander. This is the takeoff of the Chandrayaan-2, which was a mostly successful mission uh, by India to the moon. These are the kinds of things that make it possible to increase human population. And I would like to close. I'll read a quote from LaRouche. Um, I'll read part of it, and then we'll use the second video if it works, or I could just read it. You just gesture to me. So LaRouche says, why do we go to Mars? Because it's the nature of man to do so. 
the nature of man is expressed by the fact that we are not a fixed species with a fixed behavior. We're a species that must develop as mankind has developed, despite all the setbacks. Mankind has greatly improved since our first evidence of what mankind was on this planet. We've improved through technology, through intellectual development stimulated by technology, by improvements in culture, especially classical culture. And the purpose of man is to find his place in the universe. Don't worry about what the destination is. We've got to find our place in the universe. We must develop. Mankind is creative. Mankind must create. Mankind must develop. And if we do that, the space program, as we would develop it, my estimate is that it will take three generations to develop the capability to actually put human beings safely on Mars, to solve the problems of gravitation and interplanetary flight and that sort of thing. We can do it. We don't have a population which is trained yet to undertake that mission. But we have a population which is ready to be uplifted from despair now and plan that the grandchildren of people today, of young people today, the grandchildren of young people today will solve those problems. And it should be the mission to dedicate the United States in particular and the planet as a whole to that mission, to give mankind a sense and a determination of a future which should belong to mankind. We have to put a name on a mission for the human species. And the name we put on it for the short term is the Mars mission, LaRouche said in 2010. And we say that within generations, we'll take this wretched nation, this poor, broken down, ruined, betrayed nation, and in cooperation with other nations on the planet, we will develop a technology and the people, the people capable of carrying it, which will step by step bring man to his true dignity to recognize the place of man in the universe. Now, not to what we're going to do in the universe ultimately, but to know that we're there and we need that. You know, people talk about immortality and so forth. What's it mean? Just another person being produced to replace the one that died? No. Immortality is the certain understanding that you are living today because you are doing something which is going to lead to the development of man's power in the future. Your immortality lies in your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren beyond that. Your immortality, your purpose of your life, is what comes out of it. That you are a permanent part of the universe. Because by developing within the universe, you've demonstrated that you're not just a drop on the planet. You're part of the universe forever. And that should motivate you. We looked a moment ago at some very basic indicators of physical life, of the fact that there are 800, seven, sorry, 700 million people still living in extreme poverty, some of these other figures. Among people not living in extreme poverty, how many can respond affirmatively to the challenge that LaRouche posed there in this speech that I just quoted from. How many people are living in a way that they can feel confident that they weren't just a drop of water in a stream of life on the planet, but that they touched the universe and did something that will have an enduring value for the human species? And how can we increase the number of people that can participate in that, that can know that they were part of something grander in that sense? It's to that mission that the LaRouche movement, the LaRouche PAC, is unique as a political force in the United States and, I would say, on this planet in laying out perspectives for the world as a whole, nations to work together to follow, to develop, from the World Land Bridge, first developed decades ago, and which is now being essentially adopted as policy by the Chinese government, to the specific proposals that LaRouche has made over the decades on the space program, recognizing that this is the place to focus. If we want to improve the economy, not by a few percent, but by a thousand percent, over a generation or two, having 10 times more power over the universe around us. When we think about how our economy is doing, instead of comparing it to last year or five years ago, compare it to where we could have been today 
if the process unleashed by Kennedy had not been stopped. Compared to that, we are very far behind. And I think that that's the kind of outlook that lets us think about where we ought to be in two generations from now. So it's essential to have such a long-term mission. What can we reliably say now will provide sustained development for one or two generations to come? You set long-term goals that are going to require a commitment over the long term to make them happen. The development of nuclear rockets to be able to industrialize the moon and then be able to go to Mars in a safe way and set up science cities there, this is the kind of grand, enormous vision that will not only inspire people, but will drive the breakthroughs that are going to make huge economic progress as well. That kind of development is the only sustainable kind. I'm going to have Daniel Burke, who is a candidate for US Senate in New Jersey, come up and address the days of action and what was accomplished. Daniel? Thank you, Dennis. Are you able to put the, uh, the slides up? Thank you. OK. I'm so happy to see everyone. And uh, I think I re reiterate what I said on a web webcast that we gave on the website yesterday uh, with Matt Ogden and Dennis Small, which is that if you had any hand in this International Week of Action, then I have a feeling that you are very happy. Because it makes a person happy to, uh, to go to, to the youth of the country and of the world with a profound commitment to their future and to invite them, come on board, let's make this happen, let's succeed, let's get the victory that we need. So. Uh, here are some pictures, and then I'm going to tell you what we're doing with, with this, what comes next. Because it's very clear that we have catalyzed something in the international LaRouche movement, which must be the catalyst for the changes in government policy across the world. And the ideas that underpin that policy. So this is Princeton. This past week, I took this photo, and you can see uh, uh, LaRouche Pack's Megan Beats and Tom O'Connell are there. There's a sign, CO2 is not a pollutant. And I'll tell a short story on this, which is that we, ran, we, we went all over the campus leaving copies of Helga's statement, um, The Age of Reason, International Call to Youth, The Age of Reason is in the Stars. And uh, we ran into a... Um, a Princeton aeronautics professor who was uh, a, a very upset to see, our, <laughs> to see our sign. And he was not at all happy to see that we were supporting President Trump's Artemis program. But he stood and he took it and he listened. And we were out in front organizing his students to make sure that this future comes about. And I hope that we can change his mind too. This is um, this is in Michigan. This is at Oakland University. The world needs more people. Great response in Michigan. Excellent response. One, one young man came up and he said, Are you telling me that this guy LaRouche proved that there was no such thing as limits to growth? Why didn't I know that? You didn't tell me that. You didn't, I didn't know that. Show it to me. This is uh, University of Houston. One of the most effective deployments that we did this week. We had 500 people take leaflets. We had 50 people sign up, students, in just a matter of hours. End green lunacy. Build the lunar city. Thanks to, thanks to Art Murphy. <laughs> for that side. And uh, just incredible positive response at the University of Houston. 
This is two nights before Keisha made her intervention at Rice University. Here, this is uh, UC Berkeley. We had 12 people come on to UC Berkeley campus for about you know, two or three hours. We just descended on the campus. We just took over and uh, we recruited many people. The trend had been, has been you go to the engineering schools and you get a stronger response, people who are thinking about science, who are willing to confront the fraud of the climate change approach of the Malthusians. Here's another picture. Stop climate change fraud, save our youth. This is Northeastern University, Lyndon LaRouche's alma mater. This is uh, in Boston, of course. The CO2 scare, our century's mass murder movement. Excellent response in Boston. We commit to the Moon Mars mission. There are no limits to growth. We are going, Apollo 1969, Artemis 2019. This is NYU, the engineering school. The Green New Deal is genocide for Africa. And here I'm going to begin to show you some of the international pictures because that's just a small section relatively if you really think about what we're doing of what would happen across the world. This is in Dresden at a technical university. These are our colleagues in Germany. This is in Sweden, in Stockholm. This is Greta Thunberg's you know, home base. And we were there with the truth. Uh, this is Mexico City at the Polytechnic University, I believe. We have a very passionate uh, Mexican movement that has very interesting relationships with a number of professors and universities. Great response. What I understand is that people, the response that we got there was that there are increasing numbers of students who recognize that the shape of the, of the, of the, of the future is being defined by Russia, China, India. It's being defined by a shift towards Eurasia, which the United States has got to join and accelerate and so forth, which North America has got to contribute to and, and become in, har in harmony with. Montreal. Our good friend Ilko there, we know him. And Yemen. And this is just a screenshot of a wonderful short video put out by our associates in Yemen. Uh, that's Fuad al-Jafari and his son Ali. And if you can get the concept of people um, amidst the worst conditions that we could really imagine, and their commitment is to humankind, and their view is that the rescue of Yemen will be done from the standpoint of this unconquerable optimism of the space mission, of the cooperative Moon-Mars mission, and of the extension of the Belt and Road into the World Land Bridge. And I strongly recommend that you watch all of this. All of this was covered in the webcast that we did yesterday, so I'm not going to go on about it. But I do want to emphasize that uh, um, we have a, uh, a grave threat. It's actually, it's not. The green policies have not yet gripped every part of the youth population in the United States and Europe. I can tell you it's much more difficult in Europe than in the United States. But it's not yet gripped it. But guess what? They're trying to do that. That's why they brought all of these people together uh, for the Youth Climate Summit that will take place on September 21st in Manhattan. That's why they're doing this enormous activity 
at the United Nations, and not just at the United Nations, all over the world. You probably heard this already. I was listening to the radio. It's already being discussed. Friday, actually, the tw this Friday, there will be an, uh, an international climate strike by the students. This is the kind of thing that's organized around Greta Thunberg. And it's in that context that our International Week of Action took place. We are not merely sort of saying, what a bunch of good ideas we have, why don't you get involved? What we're saying is there's a battle right now for the future of policy of the great nations of the world, and either we can win it or we can lose it, and we might be the difference. In fact, I'm quite sure of that, that this movement and like-minded people and people inspired by this movement and things like uh, my Senate campaign will be uh, deciding factors in just where, uh, where, where mankind goes. So that's my brief report. I want to invite you to uh, look forward to the week of the UN General Assembly. It's already starting. You know, they're already starting. The big shots show up next week in like 10 days. But I want to invite you to look forward to that and to think to what extent what things can be done such that we change the environment, that we break the controlled environment. Um, so that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much. Good. So we are open now for questions. And while people are going to the microphone and thinking about what you want to say, let me point out that uh, three weeks from today will be International Observe the Moon Day, Observe the Moon Night. Um, and in the course of the next three weeks, what we want to do is to activate uh, many of the people that we met this week uh, so that when we have our event here in New York in particular, the conception is going to be that, well, we would like to begin to discuss with those people the creation of uh, embryonic science-based uh, organizations uh, one of which we have to create, create up in the Bronx, because Jose Serrano, the congressman up there who will be retiring, has made it clear that his view is that there is no necessity to going ahead with the time frame that was announced by President Trump, that he thinks that you can do it over a longer period of time. Actually, fundamentally, what the issue there is, is that, as was said by Bridenstine, it's political that the idea is don't give Trump that benefit of that victory because that would happen if he got reelected during his administration. Uh, we can say it's not that short-sighted or it isn't that venal, uh, but it's probably worse than I'm saying. Uh, what was important for us to understand, though, is that the way for us to answer these things is to build something better. You're in actually a kind of pre-revolutionary situation all over the world. Pre-revolutionary doesn't mean it's good. It just means that you're in a situation where all of the axioms are about to be destroyed. All of the ways in which institutions were thought to be able to protect uh, the power of the establishment are all going to crumble. And that's going to happen whether they want it to happen or not. So in that circumstance, new forces emerge. In fact, in, in essence, that's exactly how Trump uh, got into the White House. And nobody saw that he was getting there except the people that were supporting him and the candidate himself. And they proceeded with a certain idea of what was possible. Uh, others were denying that it, would, it could occur. As a matter of fact, they're still denying that it did occur. And that shows you what I mean by a revolutionary circumstance. It's one in which no matter how much evidence is presented to you, you can't break with your earlier axioms because to do so would be to redefine your entire world. Well, whether you agree to have your world redefined or not is going to happen. And that's exactly why we believe it's urgent that we focus in particularly on the campuses, high schools as well, and the layer that, in fact, the city of London is trying to focus on, uh, which it thinks it can manipulate for the purposes of bringing about a form of dark age, which is going to be extended uh, to the elimination of several billion people on the planet. That's essentially what they're campaigning for right now to happen right now. But they've got to be able to justify it or to have people justified in their minds as it begins to occur. So that's really what a large part of the purpose is of this whole discussion of climate. It's not around climate. It's around killing. 
And you've got to be able to give people the notion that the fact that some people die, large numbers of people die, um, is unfortunately necessary, regrettably necessary. It's what used to be called the doctrine of regrettable necessity by a friend of ours who's now deceased, Fred Wills. That's a well-known thing that's used in diplomacy and in rhetoric uh, when you want to deliver uh, news to people that you think they would otherwise revolt if you, if you said it. And so that's what we're into. That's where we are. And, and so what I think we can do uh, now, if we go to some actual discussion, is just think about how in these next three weeks we might be deployed uh, to actually get it, create something completely new in the United States in the context of the optimistic vision that the space program actually expresses. So if anybody has either a question or comment, just go to the microphone right there, and we'll take those now. Hello, okay. Um, so, I did not finish, but I was reading the article by Bob Ingram on the, in the latest EIR uh, about this, uh, what, what's the title of it again? Um, psychedelics. Psychedelics and climate change. And so, this idea of the upcoming of what's what we're about to encounter uh, at the UN uh, and the British hand and relationship to these types of uh, decades long operation, which completely took the boomers and entire generation uh, out of the mix in terms of, uh, well, Lynn called them a failed generation, that failed generation some years ago. Now, recently, Bernie Sanders made this, uh, responded to a question and said, yes, I am in full agreement with the idea of population reduction. And as if he was gonna speak for three quarters of the planet saying, well, you know, because women have the right, using the pretext of uh, the, white, the right to reproduce, right? And he said, well, you know, a lot of women don't want, have a lot of kids. So we'll intervene and stop them from that. The reason why I mentioned Bernie Sanders is because I want to get back to the British hand uh, that is under pressure for the whole Russiagate and intelligence, but that Bernie Sanders is more an appendage of that British outlook given his relationship to his brother who's in the Labour Party of uh, Britain. So that's really my question trying to draw what that article is doing and see how in America, British agents like Bernie Sanders, whether he's aware of it or not, are here to promote that uh, genocidal policy. Well, I, yeah, Bernie Sanders. Well, in, you know, mostly he complains and grouses about things. Uh, his response to that question, I think, followed the logic in his own mind, that it would seem weird not to talk about reducing the human population if you think CO2 is a problem, and you'd say, uh, why wouldn't I just say that? So he said it. Um, I think what it goes to show is the ability to control a society through pushing longer-term cultural currents, longer-term uh, creation of axioms and thoughts in people's minds. Because you can have an attempt to get a, a, an immediate policy, like getting the Iraq war. So there was a big push to get that going. Lies about yellow cake from Britain, the threat of nuclear weapons, that foolish speech that Colin Powell made at the UN, made a fool of himself about. All of this, you know, okay, it got something to happen. This population reduction thing has been a decades-long process of trying to take over how people think about themselves as human beings, about our relationship to science, our relationship to economics, is huge. And uh, the fact that people are so susceptible to saying things like, let's have less people now, comes from the success of this, the unfortunate 
partial success of this work over this period of time. That's why it's so important to go right at those axioms. So when Daniel showed the pictures from the tables that said the world needs more people, that puts it directly. CO2 is not a pollutant, plants love it. Okay, that's something that's very directly there. And the, uh, the connection between the statement that CO2 is this generation's mass murder movement, I'm sorry, that, that, that fear over CO2 is this generation's mass murder movement, this puts right directly what the effects of these thoughts are to help people recognize that, gee, maybe they actually don't agree with what they think they think. And it's very important that we do that. So that's what I would say in general. I mean, I'm, the fact that Bernie said that is maybe, I guess, not really a you know, yeah. surprise. <clears throat> well, um I've had, uh, I have not been able to deploy uh, on the campuses, but I have had uh, some very, very intense conversations with people. Um, people that have been involved in our concerts as audience members. And uh, these, so they're, they're not bad people, but they have these passions. Um, some of it is this kind of Trump derangement. And, you know, you have to, uh, they're very intense, but they're not, um, you have to keep them from, I mean, you can't beat them up, right? So you have to really try then to draw them, uh, at least I'm, I'm thinking, to, that they have to look back to take responsibility, take them off the Trump so-called issue and then pull them into what well, kind of, well, where were you when Obama ran the operation in Libya? And then they don't really know that because now we get into a media thing. So you're reacting to headlines and next week you'll be reacting to another. Then we start bringing them into Lynn's ideas. And uh, so, but it's very intense. It's not a smooth flowing thing at all and uh, um, yet, it, it, there's a sense of accomplishment because you can see lights beginning to go off because they'd rather be free of it, but they need that type of exchange. So, uh, but they really are. It, it's more than I ever have before. It's just kind of happening. Mm. And I just, you know, maybe you'd want to talk about that because that's natural too. Mm -hmm. But something that we're taught to avoid. This is very tense. Let's not, you know, let's dance around it. So. I wanted to say that as well. Yeah, well, sometimes those things, it's, it's a relief for everybody to just go directly at it. You know, like they say, just rip the Band-Aid off, get it over with, it's much better. If there's a disagreement that's lingering around, you can suffer through it for a long time without it ever going away versus you just, you know, you pop it by talking directly about it. And maybe that's kind of intense or unpleasant for a short period of time. Um, it may not resolve, it may not just be a short period of time, but mm -hmm. unless you go at the axiom, I mean, this is the thing, so we, this comes up for us a lot, is we've got, you know, our outlook results in policies in a lot of different directions. So we have a space program, we've got a program for fusion, we've got a, a national bank, we've got a cultural renaissance, we've got a, a, about how we ought to tune our music when we sing it. I mean, there's a lot of things here, and sometimes, it might be easier to get allies on, on one issue or another. And maybe some people will really only be an ally on, on one issue at a time. But the idea that if you don't take the things on directly, I've found, they don't just kind of casually resolve themselves. Sometimes you really do have to talk about it directly. And you can do it with humor, hopefully, maybe. You, you know, you can do it in a, in a way that poses questions and helps people realize that maybe they disagree with themselves instead of with you. But uh, yeah, there's no way, there's no, if someone thinks human beings are inherently bad or that they are inherently yeah. themselves awful and so forth, well, how do, you, how do you get at that? How do you address that directly? One of the, I, interestingly, one of the ways is, is through these concerts. Because that can, in terms of like people's image of themselves and other people, that's a very emotional way to get a much better image of what a person is. Well, I think the concerts have been important because they provide a basis for dialogue because of what they've seen and that I represent that outlook. And it's not just me. There's something else going on. Mm -hmm. And it goes back a couple of hundred years even. <laughs> so that uh, has, has uh, been very helpful to then enter into 
the areas that are either tense or contentious and so on. Uh, and, you know, no, no, no one was harmed so far, so okay. it's pretty good. Thank good. you. Hi, I'm Jane, and uh, I went out on my solo uh, deployment. Usually I go out with a team, so all of the AV material is there and so on. So I went to a, um, I decided to go to a, um, an urban a campus uh, rather than contending with a um, campus that was had a campus on, and be on property of the campus. Uh, so I could be on public on a public street. So I took my sign and uh, uh, material, um, which Tim Rush, the uh, we are we are coming and Apollo 50 years ago and Artemis 2024. We are going. <clears throat> and uh, what was interesting was that um, uh, I. Um, I found that uh, the young men, uh, these, this was a, a campus mainly of young people, the young men seemed more responsive to uh, my uh, little sign and to my outreach. I don't think I had a conversation with a young woman. Um, but what was also surprising was that I found I was more articulate than I expected to be in reaching out and having an engagement. What I wasn't able to do was, was what uh, Art, uh, what Alvin was talking about in getting really more deeply into the discussion and then getting contact information. So that's my goal next time. I got out about uh, 25 flyers. Um, and um, oh, the other thing that uh, I was surprised about um, was that one young man, uh, <clears throat> didn't say, uh, didn't know, uh, I wasn't commenting about LaRouche, but what he did know uh, was uh, about questions about, um, about, not questions, about discovery realization that the FBI and the CIA have been involved in uh, undermining government for some time. I was really surprised to hear him say that, uh, but he, he knew it. So you don't have to be a LaRouchean I guess, to get that somewhere. Uh, so that was encouraging, but also I need to raise my, uh, my expectation that some people are gonna know more than I expect them to know, and that I go deeper into the conversation. So um, I did, on the phone call on Thursday night, um, I was surprised by both Dennis's and Michael's, uh, Steger's, Dennis Speed and Michael Steger's uh, response. Uh, and I, I say that because um, um, my statement was rather um, mundane, um, but Dennis made so much out of it uh, in, in his response. He enriched my understanding by his response, as did Michael, so that uh, my comment is that when we engage in some conversation, communication, dialogue, more will be forthcoming than one necessarily expects. So it was, uh, it was, uh, I was, I felt stimulated and inspired by that. So thank you. I want to say something about that here also, because the, the point was that you went out and uh, you were by yourself and you went to a college campus where ostensibly you might not have a lot in common with the people who were there, and then found that as you were out there, you were more articulate than you expected to be. That's exactly what is the nature of true learning. That's what the Socratic dialogue process is all about. Remember that Socrates taught in the street. Whenever we talk about the issues of the, of the dialogues, they're always taking place in the public square or something like that, or sometimes in a drunken party in which he's trying to extricate himself from or isn't trying to go to. And sometimes that happens too. But in general, the point is that he's always in the street. When we first uh, started out as a LaRouche movement, uh, we, of course, were not doing that at all. We were always only on campuses. 
And in fact, the first conference I attended, that was the actual argument that had broken out before I got there, which I didn't know, which was, should we stay on the campuses or should we go into the streets? The ostensible topic was the ecology movement. Because what was being said by a group of the people who were members was, well, what we have to do is keep organizing people around the idea of a positive conception of the ecology, and that's what everybody's moving into, because this was 1970. So Earth Day had just happened, okay, in that April. So it was just had begun. And so that was their idea. And what LaRouche was telling people is that they had to go off the campuses and start organizing people who were not like them at all, who were the employed, the unemployed, uh, welfare recipients, et cetera. So these are people that were the great unwashed for the, for the college students, right? You're just gonna talk to people who have ideas, but how could these people have ideas? They work with their hands. And um, this, this impressed me about Lynn because uh, since I, have, I happen to be a philosophy major, so I was looking and I was talking to people who were just completely nuts okay, in the, in the philosophy departments, who thought they knew all sorts of things. And you'd sit there and you'd sit through the classes and you know, it was boring as hell. But then if you went to his classes, he knew more, that is Lynn didn't us know more, but when if you, I remember his syllabus, what he would tell you to read. And the things he would send you home, back to home to read, were difficult material, which was also being discussed in the philosophy classes. But when you came back the next week, he would describe what was in these writings, if you had read them, and tell you exactly why they were wrong. Now, now no one else that was teaching us seemed to care enough to do that. But not only that, he actually knew it whether that was the critique of, of uh, practical reason, or it was Hegel's phenomenology of the mind, or it was many other pieces that he at that time had us reading. Uh, he, he knew these things. Uh, and so the classes, that, and his classes were for no credit. You got no credit for going to a LaRouche class. Right? There was nothing you could do with it in the academic world. So this, got, it really, this was really very interesting to some of us at the time. And I think at, on the campuses today, where people are being convinced and cajoled that, that somebody cares when all the only reason they're actually at the campus is to become a debt. The only purpose for students going to college today in the United States is for you to become a debt. And, and what, would have, what would do them a lot, a lot of good would be to read uh, Gogol's book, Dead Souls, because it's all described very well by, by, by Gogol. As a, as, a, as a humorous, uh, tragic novel. But that's what's going on with these students. Nobody cares about them because there's no future. And that's the irony, of course, of the signs is that, well, you know, why should I be educated when I have no future? Right. Why should you be? But if, there, but if the future determines the present, and if, in fact, the future is going to be made available to you, the first thing you have to do is give up your axioms that there is no future. I mean, in other words, you have to provide the future that you seek. And I think that what, what we've begun doing this week, uh, and I think we got, we're going to continue this. I mean, Helga was talking today. Uh, she's back from China and, and was referencing the fact that the idea was to continue these, these days and continue this kind of action and the coordination internationally, which is really the most important point. If you don't have something international and you speak, then it's true that what you're saying is lost. But when you're doing something that's happening internationally, as soon as you say something, that is resonating around the world. That is the placement of the voice. The placement of the voice is not your voice standing on a street corner saying something that may or may not be controversial. The placement of the voice is the array of organizers and people who are involved in the process who are dialoguing with others about it at the moment that you're stating what you state. And that's actually how policy gets changed in the United States. We don't have any direct uh, effect on policy in the way in which people often think. Even if we were talking to people in the Trump administration, it wouldn't be true that the effect would be direct in that way. The effect is what we've seen in China, in an adoption by China of aspects of our outlook on the Belt and Road. They have their own outlook on it, which they put on it. But this has been a dialogue that began with them uh, starting in 1991, actually, uh, a bit, but then really sort of escalated from 93 on. 
And so the thing that's called the uh, Belt and Road Initiative today is something that we were present at the creation of. However, China did it. And unfortunately, that was never done in the United States because Lyndon LaRouche was never exonerated. See, the reason that we are not on, Mar uh, on the moon and going back to Mars is exactly what Bridenstine said. He said it's political. It's not a technological reason. What he didn't say, because he may not know it, or he may have been afraid to say it is, well, the politics of that was that Lyndon LaRouche was incarcerated. And if you look at what he had actually produced in his presidential campaign in 1987 on going to Mars, and you look at what he said on the Moon Mars program, by incarcerating him, by turning him into a persona non grata, you implicitly condemn those uh, ideas as well. You implicitly jailed those ideas as well. And that's what the issue is in America, and it's the issue right now. So people that complain about the issue of what's wrong with America, what it does wrong, why is it so monstrous, why is it so brutal, it's very simple. Lyndon LaRouche was put in jail, and the mind of the country was also incarcerated. That's what happened. And you will never get the policies that we're talking about right now if Lyndon LaRouche is not exonerated. It's not going to happen. People can talk about it and say Trump will do it, say this one and that one will do it, and you shouldn't, we shouldn't overestimate our power. It has nothing to do with it. It's the nature of the universe. You can't violate the nature of the universe and get a, and get a positive result independent of that. No way. That's what Greek tragedy is all about. That's what it teaches people. And Lyndon LaRouche is, it was an expression at that time, and still until now, of that extraterrestrial imperative of which Croft Erica spoke. Now, individual people going out to a college campus or a street corner with a sign standing there against the tide of foolishness that has been put out there otherwise, that may seem to mean nothing. But it is an effect which, although it's virtually dimensionless, is qualitatively superior in its power to any other effect that could be attained. It's the same idea that actually characterizes what we're looking at in thermonuclear fusion and other things, what are called forms of self-organization in a plasma, that you do something, but then something else happens that you don't do. You do something with respect to heating the plasma, but then within that domain, things happen that you didn't do. But you caused it to occur. That's what we are. We are that kind of catalyst. And so since that's invisible to most people, they don't think we have any power. We have far more power than anybody else on the planet. But we don't have palpable, tangible power of the type that people think is power. That's the power of the principalities and powers. The forces of darkness and wickedness in high places. That's what people respect as power. So I think what's important about what we did this week is that we have resurrected, in one sense, a concert of activity um, that we used to use all the time, and now we're going to start to use it again. So the individuals doing these things that appear to be weak, that appear to be inconsequential, that appear to be irrelevant, peripheral, or out, out, outside of, of a fringe, they're basically, right? That's what they call them. This is, this is what's called marginal effect. It's, that's the form by which change actually always occurs. Powerful ideas expressed by physically weak, but spiritually strong individuals who stand up for truth, and truth will respond to them. I'm Tom Weissmuller. I wanted to point out something that was in common with all of the campus uh, interventions that you folks held this week. And that's that you are pointing out that people are lying to you, that the government is lying to you. If I take a poll in the room here, how many people have been told that sea level rise is accelerating? 
we're getting more sea level rise. Raise your hand, just if you've heard that. And you've heard it from the government, you've heard it from your political representatives. But the fact is, the sea level rise charts for every country in the world are available online. You can see them. There are websites that hold them. One is called sealevelinfo.com. That's not too hard to remember. And you can get the sea level chart from every city that has a tide gauge on the planet. And guess what? There is no acceleration evident in any of those charts. There is acceleration in CO2. And CO2 is dramatically going up 29% in the last uh, 30 years. That's acceleration. But the sea level is just linear. If you live in a place that has tectonics or earth movement that go up and down, that's the major impact. So a country like Norway used to have, at least in the time of the giant glaciers, miles and miles of ice pushing down on Norway. Well, guess what? That ice is gone. It's melted. A couple little mountain glaciers left, but nothing like this enormous weight that was pressed on Norway. So the people on the Norwegian coast say, yeah, sea level is not a problem. It's actually dropping. To a person who lives in Norway, they see sea level going down very slowly, linearly, no change in rate, but in some places, seven millimeters a year, which is quite a lot. So Norway is rising. And yet, how about, how about Europe? Europe, like the Netherlands and Belgium, they're actually sinking a little bit. So it doesn't take a lot to figure out that maybe there's a place in between where the land isn't sinking and the land isn't rising. So maybe that's where we ought to measure sea level rise. And, and they do it. There's a place in Denmark called Nyborg. And there you have a, a sea level rise, steady, linear in one direction, about 1.1 millimeter a year. There are places on the planet where we verify that with GPS. So we link GPS that's linked to the bedrock, and we see how much land movement there is. You subtract the land movement, and you get an accurate reading of sea level rise. The point is, nowhere on Earth is sea level rise accelerating. And yet, you hear it all the time. So the, the students who have come to your booths and, 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 and read these things that, hey, our government's not telling me the truth. What's worse, those children you saw are being taught in elementary school. Their teachers are telling them what I call parroted lies. Now, why parroted? Because the teachers are, being, are repeating what's being told by, them, by the government. They're not using their brain. They're not using the human intellect. And they're acting like parrots. <coughs> So the students say, hey, we can do something for the world by skipping school on Friday. Isn't that great? We get out of school, and we have a rationale to do so. But the rationale is false. They've been lied to. And as long as parents allow their children to be lied to, the world is not going to get any better. Now, if I can change topics, if we can go to the space program, if you go to any hospital in the world today, you see technology that didn't exist 50 years ago. It wasn't there. You didn't have CAT scans. You didn't have MRIs. These things were developed because we needed remote sensing of astronauts' health on the way to the moon and space. The advances in medical science have been enormous as a spin-off of the space program. It's not that we had to go to the moon, it's that we had to develop technology that allowed us to get to the moon. 
And the same thing for going to Mars. If the brilliance is not going to Mars, and personally, I think we should go to Phobos instead, but that's a whole other story, all right? But that we developed a technology that does it. And that technology is spread all over the world. And what is the difference? It's the human intellect, the human mind, being put to a goal and spinning off all kinds of good things in the process. That's what we need people to do. Take a goal, achieve it, and then spread the results all over the world. And the fact is, Yelarush uh, PAC has been supportive of that. And that's one of the reasons I support the LaRouche PAC, because you're on the right side of the issue. You're not lying to people. You're telling them the truth. You're uplifting the human spirit. And I salute you for that. So. That's it for the questions. We could, oh, you have something? Nothing. Okay. I have something. We'll go I'm glad we come up to the mic. But oh, okay. Go ahead. We'll listen from there. Uh, uh, we to. To. If you can. Uh, wait, don't, don't. Do that. First of all, I'm glad I. I'm glad I came today in spite of my physical difficulties. Uh, I congratulate the LaRouche organization for their reaching out into the unknown, so to speak. If that helps you. Yes. Um, however, I have been in conflict from time to time with some of the LaRouchean ideology. Uh, what did, comes to mind in particular at this time is this controversy over the environment. Um, for me, perhaps I don't pretend that I'm not uninitiated as many of my educated citizens are. However, one fact sticks out of my mind as you talk about environment. Uh, unless the books I've read about science and the history of this planet are all false, Apparently, the Earth has gone through a series of climate changes historically, going back billions of years, well before humankind. Um, so I'm a little bit befuddled on this environmental issue uh, in terms of what is the real truth, where is the ad advocacy, is it really about the truth or is it being manipulative? I think we would all agree that we're being manipulated or the attempt as such, uh, including by the British. Uh, however, I'm very troubled with this environmental issue. Um, I think it needs to be reviewed more in depth. Uh, why do I read this data in the New York Times that the temperature Celsius has gone up a half a degree or a degree and will continue to do so. Um, in fact, several months ago in a presentation by one of your fine scientific people, uh, she said that cosmic rays indeed cause a rise in water level. I hadn't known that before. But nonetheless, it's expressing a fact that is undeniable. It won't go away. Uh, and I wonder if this issue should be examined more in depth, although what I'm hearing certainly sounds like it has depth. Um, but that's my spiel. Thank you. So it seems like your question is specifically on the on the climate change aspect of environmentalism, or right, the falsehood versus truth. Right, and it's very troubling for me personally. 
Right. Who is speaking the truth? It's a tough issue, and I think because it's so big and tough, a lot of people, this is almost part of what allows people to be manipulated on it, is that it's a huge issue. The whole earth, you, you know, that's a pretty big topic. So I, I was on a campus the other day, and uh, one of the students said, well, look, if an architect, he said, are you an architect? I said, no. He said, if an architect tells you that your house is going to fall down in 10 years, wouldn't you believe him and make the changes? And I said, no, I'd ask him why he says that. I wouldn't just believe him. If I got to move out of my house, let's say to pay three times the rent for a smaller place, I would want to find out why. And so the fact that so many people don't even try to get a grip on the subject. One of the things that I found helpful is to break it up into smaller pieces. So one thing is, what is the temperature record? Um, has the temperature increased over the past century? Yes. Do we know what it will do in the future? Well, let's be honest and say that that's based on hypotheses and theories and models. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not, but we don't, you don't know if a model is right until you've tested it out or you verified its assumptions. So uh, as far as the temperature record itself, it gets adjusted. So the same data range as presented 20 years ago compared to today They've made an effort to erase the warmer temperatures in the 20s and 30s. They no longer present the medieval warm period. They kind of remove that as though that never happened. So the temperature data itself, that's one thing to look at. Another thing is how have the models done? These models have been, versions of them have been operating for decades so that we can compare their past predictions, predictions made a decade ago with temperatures today and we can see are these things working or not? They don't do so well. We can then break down the proposed solutions. People say, because of this calamity, this is the solution. Now, you could go to a doctor who is crazy, who will say to you, you know you have high blood sugar, therefore you need to apply leeches. Maybe the blood sugar part is right, but is this the best medical advice for what to do about it? Right. So then when you get to that aspect, people present this green energy stuff as though there's no downside, as opposed to the fact that spending tens of trillions of dollars to build solar panels or windmills means that you're not spending it on something else, which means direct poverty and death of people around the world. That is the impact. If it's not necessary to spend the money this way and you're doing it, you are sentencing people to death and to poverty in doing that. So that, that's, one, that's, that's just one piece of advice, is that to many people, as they think about it, it's a yes or no question. Are you good or bad? Do you believe science or not? You say, well, let's, let's talk, let's look at, at these aspects of it. And, um, and then it's just, it is a lot of work to get into each part of it. The, the 2015 report, by executive intelligence review. Global warming is population reduction, not science. This goes through many aspects of this, and there's a new report that we will be releasing very soon. It's almost done, uh, an updated version of that, going through what the, the science is, what, where the money is in all of this, the cost of the proposed remedies, sort of take each aspect of this, because there are many of them and including, very importantly from us, what's the political outlook of the origin of this idea? And that goes right to empire. I see. If I may thank you for that, uh, I want to add the very big reality that we as human beings are a rivalous species meaning that we try to manipulate the ideas of other people to our purpose or our views. And so that condition in itself makes it very difficult to disseminate falsehood from truth. Uh, and I think that's part of the struggle going on right now. Uh, whether the British are involved or not, I think is really beside the point. You may very well be right about them but it makes no sense to me if they seize the world. A world, what, poisoned by nuclear war? 
So it makes me question their motivation for re-seeking dominance. Um, but that aside, I think the environmental issue is critical that we can't afford to ignore it. And yes, it's fantastic that we have an opportunity to travel to the stars. Um, and uh, perhaps we will find out what our uh, role is in creativity and consciousness as a result. But thank you. No, oh, thank you. Well, I'm not doing this. Can I add? Oh, yeah, sure. I just want to uh, add a little bit more on that. One thing I meant to mention, another aspect is people claim a relationship between CO2 and temperature. And then people go much further and say that general badness will occur if we have more CO2. So they say it's not just temperature, but anything you don't like about the weather, there's going to be more of that. Do you dislike it when it rains? Well, it's going to rain more. Do you think it's too hot? It'll be hot. Is it too cold for you? It'll be colder. There's going to be more tornadoes. There's going to be more hurricanes. These things just aren't happening. We've had about, we had 12 years without major hurricanes after 2005 in the U.S. We had, I think, a, I think this was the first year that a high-powered uh, tornado hasn't yet touched down. Uh, tornadoes are not up. So this is just another aspect of it, as the weather claims. On the rivalrous aspect about what the human species is. Look, a lot of the trouble is that, because you meet, you know, if people say, trust the science, the scientists all believe this, that's not a scientific kind of argument. That's an appeal to authority. It just is. If you say that, that's an appeal to authority. If you say, let me go through some things with you, okay, now you're actually looking at something about reason. If students in their education are not making discoveries, but are being told things that they're supposed to repeat on a test, and then they're told that's the right thing to repeat on a test, even if the things that they're learning are right. Maybe they're learning formulas in math or in physics that actually are accurate. But if they're never having that experience of knowing why those things are true, how they were arrived at, then they're not equipped to make judgments where there's controversy about whether something's a principle or not. So we're not equipping people through education to be able to come to a conclusion on these things very well. That's the other aspect that I would want to add. Yeah, yeah, I just want to, well, I'm sorry. Why'd you go? <clears throat> just the, this, there are about three or four people that were previously major uh, personages in the environmentalist movement. Patrick Moore was one. He was one of the founders of Greenpeace. Uh, there's a guy named Michael Schellenberger, not Schellenhuber, Schellenberger, who was uh, sort of a dis descendant of uh, Patrick Moore. Uh, and there's been a few other people. Uh, uh, Stuart, uh, Brand uh, was his first name. Uh, Stuart Brand, sorry. Uh, who uh, founded the whole Earth Catalog. So these are guys who are hardcore environmentalists, I mean, in every sense. What they have admitted uh, in each case is a little bit different, but they all admit that the conclusions they had initially were wrong. As, as there's a, there's a, uh, a video, a documentary called Pandora's Promise, which is about nuclear energy, and it begins with a discussion in which uh, Stuart Brand, in particular, talks about the idea, what if everything I thought was wrong? Now, it takes a certain amount of courage, courage to think something like that. And I'm not really saying that their conclusions now are right, because actually a lot of their conclusion, conclusion is, is, in you know, order to stop global warming, we need to use fission power. Okay? Well, we don't agree that that's the reason to use fission power. Uh, we don't agree that there is any warming going on. We don't agree that the CO2 is a pollutant. Uh, and if, so if something is going on, it's not man-caused. It's not caused by the human race. Further, if you truly believed that that were the case, then you would be looking for solutions in which you are able to use greater amounts of energy with different technological bases. And you therefore would have been working with people like us uh, on what we proposed and got passed through the Congress in 1980, the, the, the McCormick bill, 
which uh, provided for a crash program of 20 years for the development of thermonuclear fusion. But it was never funded. Uh, and even though that's still on the books and it could still be implemented, uh, as was said by Bridenstine, it's a political problem. So when people today say they're worried about the environment, but some of us know that for the last 39 years, there's a bill that was proposed, which was for 20 years then, for a crash program that would have succeeded in that 20 years, so that we should right now be two decades be, be, be beyond the, the solution to the crisis, we get a little upset because we know that there's a certain insincerity in what people are saying, since you can find us on many street corners of America to know that we, th that we did that. Our people who are out there can tell you that, and even if they don't know it, they refer to the office, hey, I got a guy who came here was asking a question I thought was serious. What did we do? Did we ever think about this problem? We did more than think about the problem. We mobilized the president that we were completely opposed to, Jimmy Carter, to sign a bill after it got through the House of Representatives and the US Senate. So it was placed in the law and it still wasn't done. So why is that? Well, same reason Lyndon LaRouche went to jail eight years later, exact same reason. Because there are principalities and powers, yeah? the forces of a dark, darkness and wickedness in high places, that's why. So we have to defeat those forces, and uh, I, we appreciate what you said. We, we understand that that was really, you know, that's an important thing, and I think it's true of a lot of people. I'm sure that over two-thirds of the people that are repeating these things really mean it, but a third of them don't, and that's the third that's actually manipulating the other two-thirds. So we um, are involved, it's like Bernie Sanders' brother. Hmm? who is the health director, health spokesman for the, for the British Green Party. They were both born in Brooklyn, but the brother has been a, uh, a citizen uh, of England. He moved there in 68, became a citizen. I know he was running for pay power over there by, for, for office, rather, by 1980. Left the Labor Party when he thought it went to the right under Tony Blair, joined the Green Party, and I think from about 2005 has been a spokesperson for it. He's 84 years old. He's, he's nine years or, or eight years older, I guess, than Bernie. Uh, so, we're not just saying, well, because they're brothers, Bernie's policy is British. What we are saying is that the impact on the rest of the world of bad policy being expressed by presidential candidates, including front runners, is that civilization will not survive that. And our job is to make sure that that happens. So it is tough, like, like, like Jason said, and, and, and knowing the details of it is important. But it's also important to kind of recognize our own organization's experience with this. That from literally the first moment I saw Lyndon LaRouche, there was a fight going on involving ecology and the environment. In the very first meeting I walked into, which was a national meeting, I'd met the organizers earlier, so for, for the past literally 50 years, we have been addressing this matter. And um, I don't mean that that is why uh, you shouldn't, or anybody shouldn't ask about it. It's a nagging and important matter to be talked about. But it's an issue of truth. It's an issue of the placement of the voice. It's the issue of the, of the integrity to admit that you're wrong, which a few people have done. And that's to their credit. So the fact that I may not agree with them about the particular things they're saying, or all, we, would not, we would not make that our policy. We refuse to hide behind the CO2 thing to get nuclear fusion by saying it's completely clean, which a lot of other people are trying to do. The point is, is that there's a dialogue. And there's something going on that's new in the United States that we're going to pursue and perpetuate. Do you have any other questions? Is it? Or, are, are, is you going to the microphone or are we finished? Oh, okay. He's in the microphone. I don't well, really I, have as many questions for you, but I would like you to. Uh, don't run down 84 year old people. Don't what? I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I was just. 
heard where somebody was talking about the king's clothes. Everybody know that little story? Yeah. About where the, everybody got on the van, but nobody dared say anything different. And I think that's very much this environmental unit. I, I spent my career in the, in the USDA working for the Soil Conservation Service, which has become the Soil the Resource Conservation Service. And we were very close to the environment and how to save things and so forth, recycle and so forth. Mm. I spent eight years in Illinois. And to be able to talk out there with farmers and so forth, you had to know the Kansan, Nebraskan, Illinoisan, and Wisconsin. Everybody know what that means? Aha, you didn't pay attention in geology. They were the four last glacial ages that covered the, the good part of the continent of the United States, almost, uh, I think they got down to the Raritan River here, but uh, in Illinois, not only do they have the terminal glacier where this glacial bulldozed everything down, but they had sermon, uh, intermittent where they, they go back and then they come back and then they go back and then they come back. And eventually, you know, the whole damn thing melted. But uh, the, the, the things do warm up and cool off. And uh, I, I don't think we should panic about it. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, I forget, some NASA or somebody just said, well, maybe the United the, the world is, you know, sometimes you get a little closer to some, a little further from some. Maybe that has something to do with it. And uh, so that's just another one of those ideas that people throw out why things change. Well, who knows why things change? Uh, my, don't like to, again, I have to, you know, go back to Rutgers. A subject came up there, and uh, the prof said, well, there's cycles and cycles and cycles, and some are in sync, and some are counter syncing, and uh, you, have all these different things going on, and you you just have to live with what comes out. Gentlemen, thank you, and uh, th don't take that 84-year-old joke bad. We, we, uh, just... All right, so <laughs> I, th I think we're going we're gonna to end now, uh, not because of the last comment, but we know, we're just, we've been going for a while, and I want to thank everybody for coming this week. Again, for people who are watching, uh, we are going to be continuing these days of action, and if you're interested in being part of our committees of correspondence, please contact organizers in your various areas uh, or our national center as well. So on behalf of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, I want to thank everybody for being here, and we're going to conclude at this point.